Dollars to Donuts with your host, Steve Portugal. Hi, and welcome to Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where we talk with the people who lead user research in their organization. I'm Steve Portugal. If you are curious about developing your team's user research superpowers, or if you want a partner in discovering and acting on new insights, get in touch at Portugal.com. You can also buy my book, Interviewing Users, from Rosenfeld Media and Amazon. Carrie McAleer Fort is the Director of User Experience Research at Sears Holdings in Chicago. She started off her career in theater and film production, and in a way that she characterizes as windy, she's ended up working in the online design and research industry for 16-ish years. She admits to being a podcast geek, which is yet another reason to have her on Dollars to Donuts. Well, thanks for joining us today, Carrie. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So let's start as we do with a bit of an introduction. Uh, Maybe you could describe the organization that you're at and uh, the role that you have there. Sure. I am the Director of User Experience Research for Sears Holdings, and I have a team of seven full-time researchers, and we specifically focus on experience research. By many accounts, it's a pretty straightforward organization where UCD and UX people are concerned. We sit directly within a customer experience organization that has user experience architects and designers and copywriters and product managers and um, product and UX work hand in hand also with analytics. And we do a really wide range of uh, methodologies to support answering the questions that they have around design and around the experience in general. I'm going to go right back to one of the first things you said. So you mentioned Sears Holdings. Uh, and so how do we know Sears? What, what do we know Sears Holdings as, as, as consumers or as uh, consumers in North America, at least? The two main brands that everyone would be familiar with would be Sears and Kmart, since we are under one company. So the websites, the mobile applications and devices, and then obviously the physical stores are all things that we uh, spend time researching. So, so I'm sorry, I want to make sure all three. So the, yep. the, the websites for both brands, the stores for both brands, and then the mobile apps or other kinds of tools for both brands as well? Mobile and tablet. Right. Our, because of uh, where our team sits, uh, the, the UX and the product management does have a particular digital focus. So most of our time is spent focusing on the website, mobile phones, and tablets. However, you know, Sears is, has been in the integrated retail arena for a long time now. So we definitely uh, take an approach where whenever we can, we're looking at the holistic end to end experience. So somebody might be, you know, at home on their tablet, they're on the iPad watching television, they see something that's interesting. And then the next day they're at work and they pull it up and they're like, "Mm, that's pretty interesting. And then on the weekend, they visit a store to go, you know, check out the refrigerator, open the door, and they're pulling it up on their phone to check out reviews. So again, most of our work is done in the in the, with a digital focus, but it's definitely running across all of the different channels. So what's the uh, what's the geographic emphasis for your team? What where are you looking at uh, consumers? The entire U.S. from coast to coast, there are stores and online uh, is obviously omnipresent, and um, the demographic of who our customers are goes back for 125 years. So we're interested in understanding all of them. And we've, we quickly went to talking about consumers, which makes sense since your business is retail, but is that the key focus for you is looking at, I don't know what your term is, shoppers, consumers? I think we, we interchangeably use shopper user, uh, but specifically member. You know, Sears is a very very member focused organization. And um, so we're looking not just at a terminal transaction of coming and, you know, and buying a product one time, but people have had generational, multi-generational relationships with the brand. So we're focused on um, understanding how that relationship thrives over time and what its different needs are over time. Does your team think about uh, or is tasked with looking at, uh, say, you know, the work of someone at, at a Sears or a Kmart store? So say from the associate side. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the supporting integrated retail requires a lot of digital you know, support in and of itself, in, uh, in and of itself. So 
Uh, some of the work we do is focused on you know, apps and sites that associates in the stores or you know, in other parts of the company are using to, to help run the company. Uh, but by far the, the most common type of research that we would do would be around understanding what it's like to shop at Sears. Okay. I think that, that, and that makes sense on retrospect. I think I have the experience sometimes of talking to people where I know their product or service as a, as a user of it and only to find out that they work on, that there's a million things going on behind the scenes that they work on. So I guess that's behind my question, kind of where your emphasis is, but you're really, you're, uh, you're looking at the members and, and their experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so th- also at the beginning, you described a little bit about um, your team. You said, I think you said there was seven of you. Mm-hmm. Can you say a little more about kind of what the, what the skill sets or roles that you have in that team? The, the skill sets are, are really wide ranging. Um, like a lot of people in UX, people have, have come to UX research through many different paths, whether it be psychology or rhetoric or something completely uh, unrelated. Our f- focus, I'd say that the vast majority of what we do is evaluation of a design, of a specific design. So that might be a current website. It might be a cur- current um, uh, phone app. And then we also do some sort of uh, generative work. Uh, we do some field work. Again, you know, when we get into the, the integrative retail point of view, we really need to understand what it's like to transition from one device to the other and um, how those needs change and, and where are the gaps between them. So uh, the team's poised to change very quickly from different types of tools to meet the different needs of every project that we're doing. I like how you characterize kind of the the world of UX and UX research in general. Is there's you didn't use the word generalist, but there's something, <laughs> yeah, there's something there about how we all do a lot of different kinds of things. Yeah, I you know if you tried to write the job description and you know and and I have it it gets very very long and it, and it seems very intimidating because frankly to be a great experience researcher you need to understand experience design. And you also have to you know, have an understanding of how this design is relating to a business that needs to you know, support itself and needs to be successful. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, multifaceted demands put on a researcher you know, in addition to their, you know, to their immediate job. And I like how you're using the word experience researcher. And, and I don't, you know, the terms that we use are so fraught and I don't mean to <laughs> pick on you in any way, but... I'm not asking you to defend that term, but I wonder if you can explain why that's that's the term you're using. Well, it's to use a technical term. This is a ginormous company and an enormous organization within the company. And there are so many different types of research out in the universe that most people are much more familiar familiar with other types. So to say marketing research or analytics. And these things are always very much focused on numbers. So I, I do like to stay away from the terms quantitative and qualitative. Everybody likes a number. Everybody would like to, you know, from a business perspective, have that, that great confidence you get with seeing, being able to say, see, this is 5.2 and not 7.8. When you're talking about experience, you start to throw the psychosocial layers into it and, you know, it gets a little bit more difficult to attach a number to. So by co- referring to it as experience research, I think that people can relate to having an experience and they relate to it as a three-dimensional thing. And it's um, involving personalities, it's moving through time and space, and it's not just attached to, you know, an analysis of ticking numbers at the end. And is that a term that you've advocated for internally? It, I mean, it's one that we often use. We, uh, I think that within, you know, within our business, the term usability has also, I think it's become a little confining, frankly. I think that, you know, it, it has some very, almost very, some very limited definitions, I think. And when it gets to how do you answer, I mean, our focus at the end of the day is what's your question? And our job as researchers are to figure out what's the best methodology and the me- the best tool to pair together to answer that question. So frankly, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, or whether it's a usability or an HCI focus or storytelling, whatever my particular flavor is, 
I don't care so much as long as I do a great job answering your question within all of the you know constraints I have. You know, if I've got three days as opposed to three weeks, my choices are going to be really different. So, so that's the focus. That's where I like to keep our focus. A lot of times people will come to us with requests for assistance and they say, I want to do this type of a study on this to show this, as opposed to starting from, tell me what's the question you're trying to answer. What is it that's gone wrong? What is it that you're noticing that makes you feel like you need some more insight and, and let us, you know, you don't have to worry about what techniques, what tools are out there because people, you know, it's not their job to be a researcher and know our whole toolbox. So we're going to put together the best constellation of method and tool to, to get you what you need. And sometimes, you know, they're really knowledgeable and they know exactly, you know, where we're going to go with that. And sometimes uh, we use a little methodology jazz and we put things together in different ways and, and hook things up in a way that, you know, can get at some of the nuances better than things they were familiar with to begin with. Methodology jazz is a great <laughs> phrase. Yeah, I love what you're saying. And I've been talking a lot about, you know, my own terminology, I guess, the business question, the research question and the research method, and that they're all related. The business question is, what does the business want to do? And the research question is, what do we, what does the business need to, what do we need to learn in order to help inform or guide that business action? And the research method, of course, is how we're going to go about it. And that, you know, there's a relationship between the three. Do you have a theory or any thoughts about why do people approach and say, I want to do these activities as opposed to, I want to answer this question. Why is that a starting point, you think, for some people? That's a great question. I think that, you know, in, in the grand scheme, there are so many different types of research because there are so many different qu- types of questions. And it's it would be unusual for there to be one team that did them all, that did formal marketing research and analytics and experience research and, you know, whatever else we'll all come up with next. So I think that people, you know, you go with what you know. I've been around, I've heard some marketing studies before, so I guess that's what I need. I need to find out some marketing information or they're familiar with web analytics, so they want to know click rates and things like that. Um, So I think that where experience research comes in, it's often, you know, very much a matter of educating them how to work with us, letting them know what our capabilities are, and then, you know, really acting as their consultant to guide them through, you know, focus on on your business aspects or focus on the design questions that you have, and we're going to bring our, our tools to the table. A very wise approach, and I wonder if our field has has kind of done ourselves a disservice, especially in our relationships with the media, by, you know, there's stories that, the stories that we, that we think we can get attention for, that we like to tell, the media likes to, to repeat that, you know, we went and we watched people sniff perfume bottles, whatever sort of weird activity, um, <laughs> like that seems to make for a good business article, even though we've been reading those articles for, you know, a couple of decades now. I wonder if the stories that people are coming to us and saying, you know, hey, we want to do a blank. And I wonder if we're the ones that are putting those stories out there. And, you know, it's easy for me to kind of criticize other people that don't know. And then I have to educate them. And there's something almost I I can feel I can feel myself being a little judgmental sometimes of people that don't know how to how to make a proper request for me. But, you know, as I hear you talk, I think, well, maybe that's collectively our fault for for promoting those stories that seem to have a little bit of sizzle to them. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to let you off the hook. I think that they didn't come to you because they heard about a tool. They heard you, they came to you because they heard something that sounded promising to deliver the, them some results. So whatever it is you call that thingamajig over there, yeah, let's use one of those. I mean, I'm sure people have come to you and said, my business is down, so let's do some eye tracking, you know, and – you take a deep breath and you're like, all right, well, let's talk about what's going on with your business. And then, you know, we'll get to the tools last, but sometimes, you know, eye tracking is the most fantastic sales tool (laughs) ever invented. And it's actual applications, frankly, I think are really limited, you know, what it does, it does well, but so whatever it was that got them in the door, you know, that's fine. 
I'm, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're interested. The most important thing is they're wanting some feedback. They're realizing that I can't and I shouldn't make decisions in a vacuum about how to run my business, about what I think will, will, will please and delight my customers. That's a very empathic way of thinking about providing help. I mean, a lot of what we do is, 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 is a form of service to, you know, people that have some other type of question or business needs. So I think to, to approach it the way you are is, is good. And I'm, and I'm happy to be off the hook. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, we spend a lot of time on our team thinking about our own company as our users. And that really helps us make, you know, better choices about the type of research that we do. Sure. You would love weeks to put together a, a shining report that would get an A plus if you handed it in someplace. And, you know, sometimes I say that if we take that long, we have by definition made ourselves useless to the people that have to be running as fast as they can think. So you have to figure out what the most important headlines are, get it to them, be okay with the B minus, you know, you're all, you know, all overachievers on the team. So it, and, and that's hard because you know, you could get a little clearer, you know, you could get it a little bit shinier, smoother, nicer. You, you know, might have to leave out a couple of things, but that's the trade-off. What are the needs of our users? Our users need it fast. They need to get to the heart of the issues. And, you know, we're going to have to um, bank on the fact that we have a long-term relationship with them, that even if we didn't get it to it this first time in this first report, we're going to keep engaging with you. And we have that relationship and, you know, we build the rapport between the engagements where, my team isn't embedded within every single one, but we, you know, we, we assign domains to people. So they develop subject matter expertise and you develop relationships over time. And, and I think that, you know, at the, at the end of an experience study, what do you know? We've, we've made some observations. We, we have derived some feedback for them from it. Our approach is to very literally, we do not make recommendations. And, and, and that's where we differ from a lot of, um, researchers and research organizations. In my early days with Sears, I had somebody come to me and they showed me um, a report that had been done during you know a previous time. And somebody had dutifully executed a, a pretty straightforward usability test. Um, they had observed users doing things. And then they said, here's your problem as evidenced by these three observations. Therefore, here's the recommendation. And the person was struggling because there was clearly no causal link between the observations and the recommendations that were being made. I could kind of see where they were coming from, but because it was in a report in a document, you know, that uh, has a great sense of authority. Um, once it's wrapped up in that document, somebody was very dutifully saying, well, research says this is what, how we're going to solve our problem. And, you know, you start marching down that road. So we come at it from the point of view of we need to let you know what we're seeing. We let, need to let you know what we think the implications of it are, why these are important things, how they relate to other parts of the experience that we're also observing. But the actual solutioning is something that, that we're going to do with you after this report. So what I hear you talking about is, is, is taking kind of a facilitative role as opposed to a instructive role. So rather than saying you should do X, you're saying like, hey, we've, we've learned these things. We want to work with you to help determine how to, how to act on it. Exactly. Right. When we're working with newer teams, an analogy that I'll use a lot is think of us as your radiologist. A patient comes to us, we're going to you know study them, and then we're going to come away, we're going to tell you where it's broken, the nature of the break, how bad it is. And then we're going to work with the surgeons, you know, the plastic surgeons, the orthopedists. Those are the specialists that are going to come in that are going to be much more familiar with maybe things the patient has already experienced um, or maybe things that are more realistic within, you know, the whole context of, of running the hospital. So we're not, you know, we're coming in to help identify and we're going to then consult when it comes time for the solution, but not actually be the ones to deliver it. So in this, this analogy, do your, your, you know, your users, your internal clients, do they have access to surgeons? Yes, absolutely. So many times the, the, the surgeons um, are the ones that have 
come to us requesting that the patient be studied. So we're working with the user experience teams made up of the user experience architects and the designers and the front end developers and the copywriters. And then that team is working closely with the product management team that's very focused on understanding uh, the business analytics and the business goals behind that. Can you describe, um, you know, in, in as generic a form as, 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 as appropriate, of course, but, um, you know, some kind of uh, narrative about a, about a project that your team was involved in? Sure. Let's say, you know, our, our typical choreography is that for our major teams and initiatives, uh, we'll have a researcher assigned to that domain. So one domain, for instance, might be top of funnel, which for us is from the homepage to the cart. Or it could be bottom of funnel from the cart to, to check out. And our structure is is set up that way because it mirrors the way other teams are set up. So again, we're not we're not embedded per se. I wish we had those numbers, but um, you you get a general domain. So you, you meet with your domain teams and you start to formulate, you know, I'd like to call it a roadmap. But um, you know, being in retail, you have to uh, be very very flexible. So we we look at a forecast of what's coming up, and there's a two way communication between our team and the other teams that teams come to us and they say, here's a project we're working on. And we know that we would like input beforehand or input, you know, during or doing some sort of prototyping. The other form of communication is as the researcher develops experience within the domain, they have the, the advantage of not being as in the weeds uh, as the other people are about the details and the requirements and the system operation. And it allows them to, you know, have those fresh eyes to say, Hey guys, you know what? Those are important things, but we're also going to study this. And so they will um, propose additional studies many times that that, that are needed to really get a great understanding of whether or not something's successful or or the domain is working well. And then as we get closer to, say, a, a particular project, we'll work with the team on starting first and foremost, again, going back to your questions, what are the research questions that we're going for? And that's really, really important because by definition, we have to move extremely fast because they do. So identifying and articulating, here's what we're answering with this study. You know, it therefore means that we are not answering all those other great questions uh, that are not listed right here. And then we do, you know, the algorithm from here's the question, how, what measures can we um, observe? Can we gather to answer this question? Okay, what tool is the best tool to, you know, carry out those particular measures? And then uh, the researcher comes up with a test plan, reviews it. You know, this is all very tidy and assuming we have a tidy project. And then they run the study. I think that one of the things that has surprised me over the past five years is how much our focus has shifted from using our in-person usability lab to using remote tools. And we still use our lab. It's still a great asset to have uh, to be able to do these in-person studies. But remote tools are where it's at for our team. They allow us to do incredibly fast turnaround in terms of, you know, getting out to, you know, finding the right kinds of users, um, getting the the stimulus in front of somebody, whether that's a live site or, or a prototype could be a low fidelity thing that we get out there very quickly. And then we're focused on getting that report back to the teams, again, extremely fast. So we, from the day of launch of, say, a remote test, we're able to, after we've set up the test, we're able to get it out there, get all of our tests completed and the videos back, the longest within a day usually, usually much faster than that. And we're going to have the report back to the team, you know, the fully annotated report with video um, clips as well. We're going to have that to them anywhere from two to four days after that. So, you know, and, and I, think, I think our land speed record was four hours from beginning to end. We just needed to study the interaction of one particular toggle. So we you know, formulated the test, ran the test, reported it, and got it back to the team within four hours. And then obviously, you know, there are going to be studies that, that take longer um, field studies, for instance, or diary studies, something that unfolds over a number of weeks. And then once it's reported, we always, always, always have a report. Uh, we meet with the immediate team. 
and we you know, present the report. And then that's when the discussion starts. All right, here's what we know. Now, what are we doing about it? And then we become consultants and, and cohorts you know, with the design and, and the product management teams to talk through the options. In addition to you know, presenting directly to the teams and working with them, uh, we maintain an online wiki of where we publish all of our research. So while teams are focused very much on the things that, it, that they're doing, we know that they can also learn from things that have been done before and being aware of, you know, again, things happening at other points of the experience. So we have an online wiki complete with all of the video that people can go in and you know, search themselves and pull up things. And it's really important because for scalability because even with, you know, a team of seven is great. You, you can't begin to meet the, the research needs for every team, for every project that's out there. So um, we get a lot of, lot of support leveraging that. You use the word tidy to describe a certain, <laughs> how, how a it goes. Certain, what, a certain unicorn project that doesn't exist. <laughs> what are the attributes of, of less tidiness? You know, a good study. Good experience study is predicated on, you know, being able to get the participant to play along in your land of make-believe without, without, with skewing them as little as possible. We know just by participating in research, they will, they will of course be somewhat altered in their behavior. But I think that um, some things are, are easier to get them to fake than others. So if we say, Pretend you feel like shopping today. You know, that's not as big of a stretch as saying, pretend like you really want to figure out how to use a coupon today. Because the first pre just presupposes that you're somebody who shops, which is a pretty common behavior um, and something that you can actually screen for rather easily. And therefore, write a scenario to write a task set up fairly easily. The more specific or the more, the more narrow the the topic when you get to things like you know say a coupon you're really telegraphing a lot of information to the user first of all about what's going to be going on what you want them to look for and it, and and these are just the types of situations that are it's hard to set up a study so that you can be pretty confident that I'm pretty sure if I have them do this I'm they're going to end up doing what I hope they're going to do because you know you can't just say what do you think of this but sometimes it's tricky. You know, sometimes at the end of the day, what the, the team wants to know is which is better, A or B. And a small sample test isn't a great way to assess that. We say, we don't pick winners. We're going to let you know where the, the strengths and weaknesses are in each of these. We're going to let you know what people did and how people reacted to them. But I know what you want to know is you want me to point to one and say, do that one go. And so some, sometimes the untidiness or the messiness comes from, you know, having to squirm a little bit and say, sorry, love you, mean it, but we're not doing that. We're going to answer this for you instead. I love to hear that, you know, given the timeline that you are working on, which are quite amazing, there's a lot of investment in your limited time frame in aligning on the problem and the approach. And I think you said something about we're going to answer this. We're not going to be able to answer that right now. And in order to answer this, we're going to do this other thing as well. So you're really focusing on having that conversation to, to, to figure out together what we're going to, this is what we're going to do in order to, to address your question. Um, and that seems like that's a hard space for some teams that they, you know, they're trying to get away from sort of taking sort of dictated uh, requests, but you're really, you're bringing the expertise and, and working together with them to figure out, uh, like you said before, what are your questions and how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, and we can do that because we have an ongoing relationship as an internal in-house team. And if you have a, you know, an organizational model where say, for instance, you know, you're only going to get one study, then you're going to be really, really starving to answer all of your questions. And, want to cram as much in there as you can. Whereas, you know, if, if you have an ongoing relationship and hopefully ideally you're not going to get just one study, you're at least at the very least going to have sort of an ad hoc relationship with the research team, you know, subsequent to your study that you can, you know, there's not as much pressure on that. And I think that people are a little more open to, to some mentoring about how to approach breaking down what their question needs are. Um, because it, it's, 
the teams, I mean, they know what they need to know. They're usually right on. They usually just have a hundred questions and, you know, we need to narrow you down to 10, <laughs> you know, per study and then go from there. Anything else about this relationship that you have with these teams, which is because this seems to be really key to, you know, how you're being successful and what you're trying to accomplish. Are there other things that are, that are going on in that relationship, maybe outside that, you know, you've mentioned the wiki and you've mentioned sort of what the choreography of a project is. Anything else? I think that some of the greatest success relies on having a great communication flow with our teams, but I've been really, really passionate that we remain a separate organization, that we remain a separate team because, you know, as much as um, we want the company to succeed, our, you know, we're Switzerland and you look at our flag and you see the face of the member on it. So we really need to have kind of this dual relationship of, you know, having great open communication. And yet I need to be just as excited to deliver terrible news to you about your study as I am to deliver good news. I also want our teams to, to succeed in being able to explore their ideas. But when somebody comes to me and says, Hey, you know, I, I, I want to run a study because I need some ammunition for fill in the blank, you know, mm, a flag goes up and like, well, okay, I'm not going to worry about what you're doing with this. What I want to know is what is your question? Everybody's heard that Switzerland reference a million times <laughs> around here. Um, because they can get the fact that, you know, to have research, quote unquote, in your pocket does nobody any good. We have no interest in, in, in it's very dangerous. We run the risk of being seen as biased if we're only attending to the needs of one group or one particular um, kind of initiative. You know, what you're describing, the Switzerland example reminds me of something that Michael Kronthal, who up until recently was uh, in a similar role to yours at Yahoo!, uh, is not anymore, but uh, I saw him give a talk and he had a, this really cool model, which he described three or four different models as to what the relationship is between kind of the researcher, the, in your, in your parlance, the member and the user. And, you know, one of them was Sherpa, you know, where kind of the researcher brings the, the internal team kind of to that world of, of the member and he had these great graphics that kind of showed, you know, in different organizations, it can work in different ways. And it wasn't one was better than the other. And so that that Switzerland aspect is in there as well. And, you know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll have to find that. I, I haven't been able to. I've, I've been looking for it yeah, for a while because really it was so concise. And, you know, and when you saw it, it's like, yeah, we do all those things. And I've worked with groups that are one more than the other. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. But I like the Switzerland thing because I think that that speaks to not only what the sort of process is, but much more what the mindset is, you know, that you are there to to kind of bridge and represent and, and enable and connect these different these different constituencies. Right. Yeah. A good test doesn't always mean good news, but um, you're definitely going to benefit from getting your bad news because there's no escaping it if you let it out without changing it. Can you talk a little about the history of the of, of experience research within within your organization, of course? Yeah, it's been a really, well, I think it's a really exciting time to be a researcher within retail in particular, um, because there's there's so much change going on. I would call it, we need a word that's bigger than change. Five years ago, when I first joined, uh, there was a team of one. So, and I became the team of one. And what you had were um, a lot of people that, like like a lot of other organizations, were used to being hybrids. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be a UXA until I need something tested, and then I'm going to put on a researcher hat, and then I'm going to do that. And I think that you know, there's definitely, definitely a benefit of being able to you know knock off a test on your own and know how to do that really well. But there was there was a definite craving in the organization for more feedback. We, we, we tend to use the word feedback rather than data or research because I think that, you know, it allows you to be more flexible in what you actually mean by that. Um, feedback can be something you're getting from ad hoc research or it can be something from, from a, more, a more formalized study. But what was clear, obviously, you know, how much can one person do? So it all comes down to scale and our people, the scale and, and the appetite to invest 
So, you know, no big news to anybody listening to this podcast. It can be difficult to convince people to invest in research or invest in experience research in particular. They can feel a little, a little more comfy investing in marketing, say, or investing in analytics because um, it's, it's very literal and it feels very knowable in many ways. In order to be able to feed the starving kids at the door, we needed to find a way to start to, to prove the value and to prove some, some sense of scalability that it's not something that's going to take this massive investment. It's not going to slow down timetables, that there's a way that you can have a really practical, savvy, lightweight research practice while, you know, still delivering great results and still, um, you know, thinking about great design experiences. You know, so in, in, in the, the earlier years, it was very focused on how light can we go? How, how short can we go? How fast can we go? Um, because I think you can go too fast if you, you know, skip, especially those early important steps of focusing on, you know, okay, let's clarify, what are we doing? What are we answering? Okay, go. You know, you, you do tend to get your favorite methods and your favorite routine. And, and sometimes at the end, if you, if you cut the wrong corners, there's a gotcha at the end of, oh, that's not what you actually <laughs> wanted to answer. You wanted to answer something else. So anyway, so a lot of the my focus on remote tools um, and lightweight methodologies really came from needing to attend to the needs of of our users, who are you know our internal teams. This type of information and feedback is such an easy sell once people get it, once they experience it. You know, once typically people are like, well, I would never want to do a project without that again, because it's so enlightening, and it's enlightening in a way that that's I think even more approachable and even more knowable than a number, you know, at the end of the day, if I watch somebody doing something, if I'm watching a 20 second clip, you know, cognitively, I'm getting so much more information out of that than looking at, you know, a chart with a line charts with lines are really important, but they're only part of the story. So we're really able to, to deliver the other side of that. So as you know, demand grew and as confidence in, in the, the, the leaders grew, some other very important leaders came into the organization and, and they were pivotal in coming in from organizations that, that didn't have the long, long leg legacy of, of I think any company with, with a, a longstanding legacy. You know, it's a double-edged sword. You've, you've got great culture and traditions and, and sometimes there are, are routines that are very difficult or attitudes that are very difficult to change. So leadership coming in from other more new world uh, organizations really brought the point of view of, well, of course, it's just table stakes. Of course, you have to to understand the experience. So the, the the team started to grow, the core team, meaning the team that's, you know, attending to the universal websites, uh, the universal applications, things like that. And then we started to develop such great relationships with some of our internal businesses. And to us, a business, an internal business, for instance, would be hard lines, appliances, or soft lines, clothing. If we're researching, you know, what's a great shopping cart, um, it's not necessarily speaking to all the, the most important needs of somebody who say shopping for clothing. So we started establishing relationships with some of our other business units to focus on other types of things. So, so that allowed our team to grow even more people who could specialize not just in an area of the funnel, but um, in a particular point of view or type of shopping. And then the other part that's been a really interesting space for us to grow into has been the non-shopping sites. So Sears Home Services, Sears Parts Direct. So if you're thinking about it as a lifelong relationship with a brand where I'm getting to know a brand, I'm making purchases, and then I'm maintaining and taking care of not just these things, but my entire home over a lifespan, there's some really great opportunities that, that come up there. So once we started to connect and establish relationships with those teams, you know, we were allowed to grow even more and look forward to continuing to grow because I think that the spaces where we need to answer questions about experience are just, they're ballooning with all of the different social and technological advances. And, you know, I think that we're on this really exciting doorway right now into the land of the internet of everything where you know, what happens when everything you look at is connected and can, can speak to each other. I think that's just, for researchers, that's just fascinating. And I think that it's also going to be really interesting to find out what we have to let go of 
and what's not going to apply anymore and what new lessons and paradigms and principles are going to come from from the new ways of being. Who, what, what are you going to look for, you know, as you have been growing? I guess it's sort of, you know, a recent and future question. Um, you know, your team has been growing and you're looking forward to this imminent growth as, as the topics explode. Who and what kind of makes for a good addition to your team? The type of researcher? Hmm. A type of person or the type of researcher, you know, what is it that you're looking at? I've been really lucky to find some really special researchers on my team. And I think that what they all excel at is regardless of their beginnings, regardless of what their undergrad or their graduate degree is, they really understand, they understand why the research question is important. So you can do methodology jazz, but you got to understand your scales. You have to be able to do the basics. So as long as you have, you know, a really clear understanding of, you know, the academic principles behind qualitative research, research of any kind, scientific theory, scientific method, then I think that that then frees you to explore and to play around. Oh, there's a new tool out. There's a new, you know, <laughs> there's a new remote going to solve the world and, and, you know, run your business kind of tool out. Does it work or doesn't it? Um, I think that, you know, you have the foundation of the classical theory, the foundation of the academic, and then the curiosity to play, really, to play around. Um, <laughs> I want to say, it, not that we don't take it seriously, but I think that, you know, if you, if you want a template, a template should only ever be your, your springboard. So to think that we would do the same method, the same tool forever or for most, to me is, is missing out on one of the most important parts of what we do is to pay attention to the nuances and pay attention to, to the direction, to the trend. Because if you're only, if you're expecting everything to fit into this box and you're not open to spotting, oh, that seems to be heading over there and I didn't expect that. We need to follow that. That's important. You have to be okay with that uncertainty and chase things down as they emerge. And is that what you mean by play? Is that uncertainty and that, you know, that looking for those moments and, and following them up? Yeah. And I think that there are many different personality types that can make a great researcher. But for me, some, somebody that needs things very checklist oriented, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this, and therefore I will have a great study. Those are, you know, checklists are great. But they don't, they're, they're very two dimensional. And so you're going to need the ability to, it's not just thinking like a computer, it's not just thinking like somebody who's going to tick off boxes. I mean, you're really thinking as a storyteller. You're looking at the entire stage, you're looking at the entire scene and understanding, you know, I'm watching this thing, but this thing is happening in a much bigger context. That possibly only makes sense to me, but, <laughs> but um, I think that there is this, you know, because a lot of what we do is about overlay structure and limits and very definable things on experience and experiences, you know, it's messy, it's, it's emerging, it's fluid, it's dynamic. So I think that you need to, you need to be comfortable in both worlds of, of knowing the importance of the constraints, knowing the importance of articulating the structure and not suffocating it in the process. You know, I've long harbored this little sort of, uh, you know, almost feel like Gollum kind of holding on to this idea that, you know, that uh, instead of precious, it's really about, it's creative. And, I, you know, I think, oh, research is creative, research is creative, you know, because research informs people that make things and that think divergently and often, you know, our work is to kind of facilitate that. I think sometimes I feel like, oh, we don't get credit for being creative, but I haven't necessarily articulated that. And, and, and certainly you've given a really just lovely kind of call to creative arms for what that play means and what the thinking is that researchers have to have, you know, I think in the, in, in the work that we're trying to do now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to be, if you aren't creative, if you are, if you, if you're somebody who really does need that unchanging rigid structure, then, you know, my guess is that you're going to have some pretty limited success in what you do, just as a business person would, it would be, you know, if business were that easy and that predictable, everybody would do it well. Right. But it's not. And a lot of it, you know, like they say, medicine, you're still practicing medicine. You don't quite 
ever know <laughs> exactly what you're doing, but you know, you work through it. What's your background? How did you kind of get to be you know, great in the way that you are great? Uh, I, like many of the researchers on the team, have a have kind of a windy background. I started off in undergrad in theater, and I was very interested in theater history and performance and design and and ended up working in film production for quite a few, few years after that and had a blast. And it's like going off with this very, very gentle, nonviolent army and, you know, going to war and go to war for a couple of weeks and then you have something in the can and, and then you're done and you move on. And, um, and that was very interesting, but most of the work I did was, um, in advertising. And I think that there's, you know, there, there was a part of me that, that felt like I wanted to branch out a little bit more because you know, advertising, you know, it's by design, pretty, pretty predictable a lot of the time. So I ended up connecting with an arts organization here in Chicago that I ran the programming for. And it was really interesting because it was arts education for for kids, uh, but it had a jobs training aspect to it. So it was paying kids minimum wage to to be mentored by a professional artist and in all of the different kinds of arts. And, you know, so one, yeah, what a blast. But some really, really interesting things caught my attention as I was there over the years. We had an inclusion program where kids with physical and cognitive disabilities were mainstreamed with all of the other kids. And we would start, that most of our programming at first took place in the summer. And in the fall, we would start to get calls from um, teachers saying, what did you do with this kid? Johnny used to be limited and have trouble relating and, and, and be very antisocial. And now he's flirting. You know, so we would hear these great anecdotal stories about kids that um, av- after having gone through I think the twofold arts experience and um, also this social experience just would have enormous personality and brain development, cognitive development. And that's kind of what, what, what drew me back to grad school. And my graduate program uh, was an interdisciplinary mix of cognitive science and instructional design and social context, which, you know, are my three favorite flavors of soup. And so I got to, got to grad school never having heard of Don Norman and then read Don Norman and said, that's it. <laughs> so uh, I became hooked on, on research and on, you know, thinking about experiences since then and have um, worked in a number of different uh, sectors of, of digital experience research since then. What, uh, what kind of soup are you serving in 10 years <laughs> from now? Oh, 10 years. Mm. I think that my, my brain is wired to really live very much in the now. And when I think about it, I'm, I'm, I'm often not the most <laughs> accurate future thinker. I can spot things, you know, immediate things. But I, I do remember the first time somebody described email to me, I kind of, you know, scrunched up my face and said, what would you do with that? <laughs> mm. So maybe not the most visionary, but, um, you know, I really think that all I can think is that the pace of technology becoming invisible to us is just in- astonishing. And whether it's it's physically invisible to us, you know, we can't see it. It's just embedded. It's a, it's a it's the internet of everything. It's my refrigerator talking to the grocery store, and things just show up. Or whether it's cognitive invisibility, where you just, of course, it's not unusual to send an email now. Of course, it's not unusual to think that I can, you know, show somebody my computer screen on the other side of the globe now. So I, I think that it's for me in ten years, I'll just continue to be fascinated in watching how people's perceptions and behaviors change according to how technology is, is really transforming the world around us. I love that. That was great. And you, and you didn't mention soup. So uh, <laughs> that was my bad and trying to belabor, belabor your That's lovely okay. metaphor. I love cooking. So. We'll, we'll talk about soup after this. <laughs> what didn't we talk about uh, in this conversation that you think we should cover? Yeah. Ask a researcher to ask you a question. You'll never stop. (laughs) Do you have any questions? That's a dangerous question. First of all, I'm really excited by this series. I think that, you know, very often researchers tend to be, you know, off in a room watching video and analyzing things. And um, it's so it's exciting to hear more about 
the practices and and the uh, just the the people that are that are in this space around the country. So th- so thanks to you for that. And and so after you've been listening to us yammer on for a while, I'm, I'm in, interested right away. What are what are the things that are surprising you of, of either trends or topics or points of view you didn't expect? Wow, <laughs> it's turning around <laughs> there. You're right. Researchers are dangerous with each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm in this interesting position as, you know, I've talked to a number of people now. And so I'm, you know, I, I, and I think this is like what happens anytime you do research is you can feel that there's something to synthesize. You know, you know, there's sort of a spider sense, I think, that I get when I have when I have parallel conversations, you know, with, with people in, in, you know, related related roles. And sometimes I try to keep myself in the living in the data, you know, don't, don't go there yet when, you know, and of course, when you have the luxury of that time. So, you know, I get these little signals here and there like, oh, that's a thing that someone else said, oh, that's very kind of different. And it's funny too, because I'm, you know, trying to be present in our conversation, but yet I keep, you know, having these little moments where my eyebrows are like, oh, wow, that's the pull quote, that's this. Mm -hmm. And now you're asking me kind of at the end to go back to that. I'm like, I'm right in this part of the conversation. I'm thinking about uh, soup in the future and your phrase, the <laughs> internet of everything. I'm just going to defer. I want to go, I want to, I, I don't know if I can answer that question right now. You did say, I was, that's, cause that's the question I was going to ask you too, is mm. like, where do you see some of your, your unique things? I mean, uh, you know, you said, I think early on that, you know, the balance is really on the, is really on the evaluative versus the generative, but I don't know. I feel like, and this is just, I'll just expose a bias. I feel like you, you talk about evaluative work with the soul of a generative researcher. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's sort of, cause I feel like evaluative research can get a bad rap that it is kind of, you know, it's convergent and it's not, it's not nuanced and it's not rich and maybe actionable, but it's sort of a, a subset of the problem. Like, those, that's a bias that I have mm-hmm. in, in general, and I'm sort of hearing my bias in the way come out by the way that I hear you talk because, uh, you know, again the 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 deep focus on you know building rapport and framing the problem, I love that, and that sort of is the that's that think research working at its best with with teams, so that I think is you know, a, a really important theme that I've heard you articulate. And, and then I'm not saying that that's a gap in anybody else, but that you just said it kind of in an interesting and I think unique way. Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably others, but I think I, I'm kind of rambling here. So I might, I might stop at that, <laughs> but I don't know. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting for you to say you're calling yourself out on your biases and, you know, turning your nose up at, at, at certain types of things. And, you know, you know, I think earlier you heard me throw some shade at eye tracking and, and the difficult relationship I have with that. And I think that marketing people roll their eyes when you talk about being able to understand anything with five people in a, an experience study and the analytics people, you know. So I think that it is really easy to um, be dismissive of other, uh, you know, of other genres, really. And I think that while while I definitely am the worst possible candidate to be a data analyst, <laughs> you know, I think that my, you know, my best scenario is to link pinkies with them and say, thank God there are people that like to do that because we need that too. You can't just watch five people and know everything. You can't just look at numbers coming off of, of, you know, web analytics and know everything. So, you know, I always say, I know a lot, I don't know everything. And there are other people that know things. And so I think that while it's, it's, it's good to have a, um, a healthy scrutiny of what something's good at and what it's not good at, I think it is important to, to think about, to use our favorite geeky term, triangulating all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, Because there's a certain, out of every question you could answer, no one technique or genre of research is going to answer all of them. And so we all have our piece of the puzzle to, to take on. And, and you you said that really well earlier on too when you talked about you know figuring out the right methodology and you know I, I totally agree that's an activity that I'm involved in you know every time that uh, you know I, I plan to do something but it also as you talk it sort of it, it raises one of my fears for myself and my own career arc I guess and you know is that um, is the tendency to be the person with the hammer that sees everything as a nail <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and. You know, obviously there's, you know, there's many hammers of different sizes and so on, but 
you know, I think the the tools are continuing to evolve and the approaches. And, you know, I, I think the way that you and your team, you know, you have some diversity there and the way that you can link pinkies, as you say, to bring many different kinds of approaches to bear to different kinds of problems, I think just sounds like it makes me feel a little anxious, but I have just, you know, big respect <laughs> for how you're describing it. That just sounds mm-hmm. great. Like that's just the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> laughing at because every time I, I, find a new gadget and there are, you know, scads of them coming out every day. It's the same thing. I, you know, suddenly the world is a bunch of nails and we have a new hammer, but I also, we have a lot of different tools at our disposal, but I also very purposefully keep the toy box kind of small because there are often variations on a theme and there's never been a tool invented in the history of mankind that does exactly what it, set out to do or is as automated as they say it is. And, you know, so tools are important. It's important to choose the right one, but at the end of the day, they also won't replace that thing inside your skull, which is your most important tool, which is being able to observe and listen and, and, and pull the important story out for your user. I think that's the great high point to, to leave it on. So let's just say thanks and goodbye. Uh, appreciate uh, your time. Really, it's a great conversation and really insightful stuff. And I thank you for, for sharing it with me and with everybody. Well, this is a blast. Thanks, Steve. And I can't wait to listen to all of them coming up after this. Very good. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dollars to Donuts. And thank you to everyone that helped me put this together. You can get links about this episode, listen to other episodes, Subscribe to the podcast and read the transcripts at portugal.com slash series slash dollars to donuts. And you can buy my book, Interviewing Users, from Amazon or from Rosenfeld Media. Get in touch with me at portugal.com to start exploring how we can work together.